And the Soul Train Music Award goes to... What's up, Cali? <laughs> You're making me high, Tony Braxton. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the cave. If this is your first time finding me, I do a lot of giveaways. Just make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel. Today we're gonna to dive into the iconic. Call it what you want. We're gonna dive into Life After Death, which is the Notorious B.I.G.'s second album, released in 1997. Bad Boy, I believe, released everything in 1997, but we'll get to that on, on another day. I mean, before I start to talk about this album, the impact of this album cannot be put into words. Okay, so a few months prior, Tupac released his album, Machiavelli, The Don, Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory, two months after his death in 1996. The album not only had a video of Tupac being shot and walking around heaven in a music video, but the album cover depicted Tupac dead on a cross. Crazy. So fast forward a few months to March 1997, uh, Biggie was out on the West Coast. Of course, he was gunned down two weeks prior to the release of his album, his sophomore album, Life After Death. If that's not enough, the album art depicts Biggie standing alongside a hearse. This happened 16 days before his album was released. As I've said before, when it comes to Tupac and Biggie, it's well documented. I don't want to go diving into things that you guys already know. Let's not waste time. Let's just dive right into the album. All right, typically I don't cover intros because intros normally aren't songs. But what I love about this intro is just Life After Death intro, which is weird. That's a, uh, that's a staple for Bad Boy albums. You know, if you go to puffy's release it would just be no way out intro this one is life after death intro what i do like about this it's a microcosm of what biggie is he's telling a story he's still telling his story from ready to die this picks up exactly where that left off you can hear suicidal thoughts playing you can biggie shot himself oh wait you know now this is the life after death i think biggie is probably the best storyteller ever i mean if you want to give him if you want to give him the GOAT status and say he's better than Jay-Z and uh, whoever your top five may be, that's fine. But as far as storytelling, nobody came close to Big. And the fact that in this case, he's carrying over his entire story into the next album, you know, it's some continuity. It's not just like, a, oh, this summer I'm gonna drop this CD, this summer I'm gonna drop that CD. It's like, nah, he's, he's, telling, his, he's telling you his life. Somebody's got to die. Storytelling. When you look at this album from top to bottom, it's a double CD. So we're talking, what, 24, 25 songs or something like that. Look at how many stories he tells. He vividly paints pictures on point. Who did what? What we got to do? He, he literally tells, Biggie is like a fucking movie director. He tells stories that are so crystal clear. You know, you, you listen to his music and it's like you're watching a drama. It's like you're watching a suspenseful film. That's how good he paints the picture of what he's trying to convey. He always makes little nods here and there, but he saluted Snoop at the very beginning. He said Snoop, then he said oops, as if it's like, as if he's not allowed to salute Snoop because of the East Coast, West Coast beef that's going on currently. But this is like, I mean, it's Hip Hop 101. I mean, it's dope, suspenseful beat, some head nod music. Tell me who starts off an album telling a story. Ready to die told a whole bunch of stories as well. So Biggie told stories. And I think a lot of reason why people gripe about today's hip hop is because nobody does such things. You don't put that much time and thought and effort into writing rhymes and telling stories. You know, everybody took Jay-Z's I don't write rhymes and they like kind of ran with it. Hypnotize. I think it's fitting that Big's biggest single is a solo track off an album full of collaborations. If you look back on Ready to Die, I mean, there was Method Man was on a song called The What. Outside of that, it's just Biggie, you know, as far as MCs go. You know, Puff had some whispers on there, whatever he does, take that, take that. But Hypnotize is, this definitely falls under the category of just timeless hip hop music. Press play 30 years from now and it goes super hard. One thing I definitely noticed about this album, the change of production. Not only does he have money now, so he can like pay for more producers. He's not just like going to Primo's house or whatever. He's like, you know, he can reach out. He can pay for any producer anywhere after the success of his first album and it shows in the production. Kick in the door. 
All right, aside from being a dope DJ premiere track, Biggie goes completely in on Nas. If you have any doubts about this song being about Nas, you make sure you click the link in the description. The untold beef of Nas versus Biggie. And it ties a lot of this shit together, but kicking the door is just classic hip hop. We appreciate this shit. It's DJ Premier, it's Biggie. It's hard to go wrong when you have that thing right there. Fuck you tonight. Token R. Kelly song. I don't really, you know, I don't really rock with R. Kelly like that for obvious reasons, but then it's like the song also isn't very special to me. I don't think. Last day. So I want to say that this is the first time that the locks had their platform on, you know, Bad Boy Records, but All About the Benjamins came out in summer of 96. I think it was leaked in summer of 96. It didn't technically come out until 97 in uh, July on Puff's album a few months after this, but this is the locks having that platform. It's pretty dope. You know, I mean, it's not as gritty as what the locks would get but you know when it's if it's under the bad boy umbrella it's not going to be too street it's not going to be lock street i love the dough it's only right that jay-z and big collab after big featured on jay-z's debut album and he was in jay-z's music video i think they did what three or four songs together big and jay-z i wish the commission really would have took off i don't know if that fell apart because of big being shot or the whole charlie baltimore situation i don't know what's beef a lot of people will automatically read the word beef and say, oh, he going to Tupac, he going to Tupac. But if you really listen to the song, I think it's more so him making a mockery of hip hop, of beefing on wax. You know what I'm saying? Because he's like, yo, what's beef? Beef is when you make your enemies start your jeep. You know what I'm saying? What we're doing, we're rapping songs back and forth at each other. This ain't beef. Now, little would he know by the time this album was released, he wouldn't be on the planet. But I think my personal feelings is that the feeling he was trying to convey is this is not beef that I'm involved in with Tupac. Beef is rule no less than 30 deep. So I don't think Tupac really was a part of the equation. Skip the interlude. More money, more problems. Now, the production is so captivating. The production reels you in and you like the song before you hear anything. So it's easy to forget that this is just still big telling his story. Again, I want to say that this is the introduction to Mace because I feel like this is the first song I ever heard Mace on, but Mace was on that Only You remix with 112 and he was on Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, which was already released as the lead single for Puff's album. So he was already out there somewhat. Harlem World wouldn't drop until later in 97, but he was still out there as a bad boy hip hop artist. Again, I feel as if this is Biggie like addressing the situations around him without like going at Tupac directly. You know what I'm saying? Picture me being scared of a nigga that breathed the same air as me. You know, but, and that's the chorus. But again, storytelling. Listen to these songs. Listen, listen to this album, man. Just, I don't know when the last time you listened to it. It came out in 1997. Go back and listen to this album. You will be surprised by how many stories he tells, top to bottom. And I'm going to keep reminding you as they go on. Next, what's the name of the next song? I Got a Story to Tell. No shit. This is a lot lighter than niggas bleed or a lot lighter than somebody's got to die, but it's storytelling and it's hip hop. You know what? It tells a story about how he in the NBA player's house fucking his girl. It's a whole situation, but it's the fact that it's a story and he puts it together. He's not just throwing words out there. You know what I'm saying? Dope shit. That's it for disc one. Notorious Thugs. First off, Bone Thugs and Harmony were all over the charts after their 1995 release. But the most notable thing about this song is that Biggie shows you that he is the catalog. What I mean by catalog is there isn't anything that he can't do. You get on a track with Bone, you know what? I'm rapping like, you know what I'm saying? He's proven he can do, he can do the down and dirty, gritty New York underground hip hop. I'm broke, Robin Steele, give me the loot, suicidal thoughts type hip hop. He's proven he can do Juicy. He's proved he can do anything. Commercial, underground, you name it. So now he's jumped to like in a subgenre, and now he's rapping like how they rap. And it fits and it's dope. This shit is live, man, still today. This shit is live. Bone Thugs and Harmony was one of the few groups 
that worked with both Biggie and Tupac during the hip hop beat. I might be wrong on this, but I, I believe Bone Thugs and Harmony released The Art of War in 97. And of course, this came out in 97 on Biggie's album. So by the time the two songs came out, both Tupac and Biggie were already gone. Miss you. This shit is sad, man. And it's kind of eerie how it's like, you know, you hear Big talk so much about death. And of course, he doesn't know it. But as we're hearing this for the first time, he's already gone. So if you're a Notorious B.I.G. fan, aside from just having to cope with the fact that he's gone, you have to hear him talk about death so much, man. It was just kind of crazy. Anyway, another. Of course, he had to have a token track with Lil' Kim. You know, we all know they have a history. It's well documented that they have a history. But again, even if you just look at Big Short Verse, storytelling. He tells a story in his one verse in the song. This shit hasn't... Nobody did this as much as he did. I mean, that's at least four or five, six tracks so far just in this album where I can say storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. Go back and check this shit out, man. This shit, I mean... I know sometimes they say albums go over people's heads, but the, the things that he was doing, man, it's like it hasn't been done since. I don't think it was been, I don't think it had been done prior. Aside from just being a dope lyricist, you can tell stories at will. It's dope. Going back to Cali. There's a few things about this track. Of course, it's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. We all know in this climate right now, we're still months after Tupac was killed. And yes, that was in Vegas. But we're just months after that. So it's not like it's been years or anything. And he and then here comes Biggie going, going back, back to Cali, Cali. It's like the beef was never really like squashed or however you want to put it. It was never settled. I mean, I know Big was determined he was just going to grow from it. I've seen a lot of interviews where he's like, yo, I'm just going to do me. They're going to accept me for who I am. But it's like, yeah, nah, they ain't. It wasn't as forgiving, like, allegedly. But something crazy about this shit, though, is uh, this beat samples more bounce to the ounce, okay? Which is by Zap. Zap sings California Love. So going back to Cali in some way, shape, or form can be viewed as a response to California Love. But as if you want to take it that far, you know, I'm not, I cannot confirm nor deny none of this shit. Ten Crack Commandments. I've probably said it 20 times on this channel. If it's DJ Premier, it's dope. If you put a legendary MC on it, it's classic. The Ten Crack Commandments, uh, I guess it's technically not storytelling, but it's like an instructional top 10. You know what I'm saying? It's still shit that isn't done, that most of these rappers don't do, because they just want to put words together and just want to have a single or just want to be in the, have their shit playing on the radio. Of course, that's Chuck D from a Public Enemy record. The crazy story behind this one is uh, DJ DJ Premier was playing this up at Hot 97 and Puffy heard it. He actually played it on the radio like once. And Puff like offered him money like right then and there like, yo, Big needs this. Never heard on the radio again and it went straight to Big. So, cool story. Play a hater. Um, I guess I'm too serious, but I don't really have time for this silly shit. You know what I'm saying? I guess it's, it's funny, whatever. Ha ha. I don't have any replay value for it. You know, after listening to it once back in 1997, I can't say that I've listened to this full song again. I just want that hip hop shit. I hate to say I'm gonna skip a Biggie song, but we gotta skip this. Nasty Boy. While Biggie is in the middle of showing all this West Coast love, it's hard not to think that he replicated Two Short's Freaky Tales with Nasty Boy, where he basically just tells several short stories about him and his sexual encounters, if you will. Sky's the limit. It's hard not to love a rags to riches story. You know, and I've said it plenty of times before. Kendrick does it. Jay-Z does it. Uh, hell, Big did it on his first album. But the structure of this song is first verse, your child. Second verse, adolescent. Third verse, you're an adult. You know what I mean? And it's just... It shows growth, and again, it kind of tells. It's, it's kind of. It's not really storytelling how the other ones were storytelling, but this is like if you're telling your story. You know, it's an autobiography. It's good music. The world is filled. Let me just say it. All right. As a mogul, as a clothing designer, as a judge on whatever TV show he's on now, I salute Puff Daddy or Diddy or Sean John, whatever you want to call him, clothing line, all of that, A and R. I give him props as a producer. I don't like Puffy on a mic. 
Because it's like, what category is it? Don't call that hip hop. Don't call it, you can't call it R&B. You know what I'm saying? And then ever since he said the famous line, you know, don't worry if I write rhymes, I write checks. So it's like, that basically says he don't write his shit. But even if somebody else writes it, it's like his whole delivery and his whole flow is just like, yeah, you just, nah. So pardon my rant. I don't really dig Puffy on the song, man. It's like, it's I, my downfall. That's actually DMC from Run DMC. I love this song. My only problem with this song, which is my problem with a lot of Biggie songs, it's just too much puff. We know you're the only, we know you started Bad Boy Records. We get it. You'll get paid. I'm not trying to go Suge Knight, but yo, sit back, man. Huh? Just sit back. Long Kiss Good Night. I struggle with Long Kiss Good Night because if you really look at the facts, if you look at the lyrics, it really appears that Biggie dissed Tupac after he was dead. I don't know if anybody ever noticed that or not. Okay, for instance, he talks about the car accident he was in. Oh, Long Kiss Goodnight is produced by the RZA, which is kind of dope because you never really think about Wu-Tang Clan and Biggie on the same page, but the first album had Method Man on it. This one, he had a song produced by the RZA, so that's kind of dope. But back to what I was saying, he talked about his car accident. The car accident happened right around the time Pac was killed. You know, he had a broken leg. I think he had a, that's why he had the cane. He can't do the whole, oh, that was recorded in 95, or he can't, you know what I mean? So it's like, a lot of the shit that he said, heard through the grapevine, you got fucked four times, you know? So it's like, you're talking to Pac. you definitely talking to Pac, homie. Really seems as if you're talking to him after you know he's been killed. You're bleeding lovely with your spirit above me. He went in. Now, I love the, the the piano or whatever. I love the production. So much of this production is just stank face hip hop. But Biggie, god damn, man, you can't be. I don't know. I mean, I, I cannot confirm or deny any of this shit, like I say. But you can't be dissing this man after he's dead because you sure ain't dissing when he was alive. Hit him up came out and you just looked at Faith like, yo, is this shit true? <laughs> but that bothered me. I definitely don't have anything bad to say about Biggie. Off the top of my head, if I had to give you my top five, Biggie was definitely top two. It's either one or two. So obviously I can't just shit on him. But in the same breath, anyway, I got to move on because it's starting to bother me. You're nobody till somebody kills you. As if the album title wasn't enough. As if the album art wasn't enough. Biggie around on the gravesite and on the hearse and dressed in black and all of that. Biggie has always just talked so much about death, man. And it's like, it's, well, this came out in 97. I'm, I'm 14, 15 years old when this comes out. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I, ha I own Ready to Die. I give you every word for Ready to Die at age 14. Damn shame I can remember all them lyrics and my transcript from high school is terrible. But this is not the platform for that. That's not what we're talking about right here. Huge Biggie fan. So when he's killed, this is like a year or so after talking about suicidal thoughts. He just got done talking about being ready to die, ready to die, ready to die. You know what I'm saying? There's suicidal thoughts. And it's like, holy shit, man. He talked a lot about death. Then he drops this. Then he's on everybody's remix, flaving your ear. Uh, only you. He's on everybody's shit. All about the Benjamin. Then he puts out his dope ass album, but in the process, he's killed. So you listening to the words of a man who's no longer on the planet, and he's talking about death so much. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy just that I'm speaking from experience. I mean, I'm I was that kid. Stevie J produced that track. For people who don't know, I've never watched a loving hip hop or loving anything, but. I know Stevie J is somebody in that world, so he produced this. That's something. But yeah, that's all I have, man. I mean, 1997 was a huge year for Bad Boy. I mean, he had Life After Death in March 25th, No Way Out July 1st, and then ha Mace's debut, Harlem World, was dropped what, October 28th. So it was a big year for Bad Boy. All About the Benjamins had just dropped in 96. You got Black Rob coming down the pipeline. You got The Locks coming down the pipeline. You got follow-ups from 112, follow-up from Total. It was just a bad boy was a was a problem. Bad boy was a big problem. So based on Cave Review's seven category metric of production, flow, lyrics, substance, impact, longevity, and originality, Life After Death scored a 93%. I'm not sure if anybody else's double CD would yield a 93. I mean, All Eyes on Me was dope, but the second disc is trash. Thanks so much for your time. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Where does this album sit for you? 
let me know. See you next time.